Hello, my name is Florian Merkel. I am a principal investigator at the University of Cambridge. Today I'll be talking about disease modeling with human pluripotent stem cells. And I'll talk about uh, my personal interest, which is disease modeling of obesity. And via that framework, I'll talk about general principles of disease modeling and some of the pitfalls that can occur when culturing stem cells and when performing gene editing. So as a general principle, one can model human diseases in vitro um, by the case control method, where one could, for example, take a series of, uh, of control patients and patients affected with a particular disease, derive induced pluripotent stem cells from them, and differentiate them into a cell type of interest that's affected in disease, for example, neurons, if you're studying neurological diseases. And then if you want this measuring a uh, phenotype that's associated with disease, um, since these are unrelated patients with diverse genetic backgrounds, there can be considerable variability that is due to not just the disease phenotype that's being measured, but also those different uh, genetic backgrounds. This can be overcome with the advent of, of uh, gene editing technology such as CRISPR-Cas9, where one can either introduce a disease variant of interest or correct it in a patient line to generate these isogenic pairs, which removes the effect of genetic background and allows the contribution of that disease variant to the cellular phenotype to be more accurately measured. But there's still the issue of what phenotype are you measuring in which cell population? So if one is differentiating in vitro heterogeneous cell population, one might first want to generate a knock-in reporter cell line to allow one to prospectively identify that gene of interest. And then on the background of that reporter cell line, one can introduce that disease-causing mutation and then either purify the cell population of interest or observe it and measure a phenotype. And this will, allows one to more confidently attribute the phenotype that's being measured in the cell type of interest to the disease variant. So as I mentioned, my interest is obesity, and genetic studies have very clearly shown that the diseases that, uh, I'm sorry, the, the genetic variants that are associated with obesity are highly enriched in the brain. And indeed, obesity is really thought of as a disease of the brain. And there are particular regions of the brain that play a central role in regulating appetite and energy expenditure. And one of those brain regions is the hypothalamus. And within the hypothalamus, there's a few cell populations, for example, the proopial melanocortin or POMC neurons that are shown here in green, that release a neuropeptide known as melanocyte stimulating hormone or MSH. And this peptide plays a potent role in regulating appetite because it binds through a receptor on downstream neurons that regulate food intake and energy expenditure. And the activity of these POMC neurons is in turn regulated by nutrients and hormones, such as the hormone leptin, which is produced by fat cells. And studies in, in humans and in mice have shown that deficiency in leptin or the leptin receptor is sufficient to cause the severe early onset childhood obesity. And since this is uh, leptin deficiency is due to you know, the, a deficiency of a hormone, replacement of that hormone can effectively cure the obesity. So this individual, uh, uh, as, as a young child, uh, was treated for four years with leptin, which completely normalized his weight. But of course, more common forms of human obesity aren't due to the defect of a particular gene. And we'd really like to understand how do cells such as these POMC or proopiomelanocortin neurons sense hormones like leptin, and how are they defective in, in, uh, in obesity? So this has been studied extensively in mice, but there are important species-specific differences between mice and humans. So it would be advantageous to be able to model this in vitro. So to this end, uh, my laboratory, uh, as well as uh, some others, have developed protocols for differentiating human pluripotent stem cells down to the neuroectodermal lineage, towards the forebrain, and then specifically patterning those forebrain progenitors into the hypothalamus. And then those hypothalamic progenitors can be encouraged to give rise to hypothalamic neurons, such as POMC neurons. 
And so if we take these cultures and stain them for neuropeptides that are either exclusively expressed in the hypothalamus or are highly enriched in the hypothalamus, we see a variety of different neuropeptides, including POMC, which you'll see up in the upper left-hand corner. And indeed, in our culture systems, we see robust induction of POMC neurons. So in a single 10 centimeter dish, we see about as many POMC neurons as you'd get in 5,000 mouse brains. So this has, of course, many advantages because we can do experiments at a scale that just wouldn't be possible or wouldn't be very, very uh, feasible to do in mice. But of course, the ability to model diseases is contingent upon how good of a model are these cells really. So uh, as I'm showing in this high magnification confocal image of one of our stem cell derived POMC neurons, if we stain for alpha MSH, uh, which is derived from POMC, we, we see that it has this very punctate vesicular like staining pattern. So this is consistent with what you would expect for a neuropeptide that's packaged into dense core vesicles for release. And to take a closer look at the, at the regulation of POMC and POMC processing and whether it's really processed into bioactive MSH, um, we, we uh, used mass spectrometry. So there's a few different levels at which POMC can be regulated. It can be regulated at the levels of transcription and translation, at the levels of processing, and of course at the level of release where it would be then available to act on the melanocortin-4 receptor on downstream neurons. So POMC is kind of famous for being this extensively post-translationally modified, uh, modified um, protein. And I've shown here a number of the different peptides that are derived from POMC, and I've highlighted in green those that are thought to play a prominent role in the regulation of appetite and energy expenditure. So in the middle, we see desacetyl alpha MSH, and which is a precursor of the mature acetylated form of alpha MSH. Also further to the right, we see beta MSH, which is not produced in the rodent brain, but the sequence is present in human brains, so it is thought that it might play a role in human energy homeostasis. Then finally, all the way to the right, we have beta endorphin, uh, which plays a role in, in nociception, but also in promoting feeding behavior. So what we did is to take our human stem cell-derived hypothalamic neurons, lyse them, and look by quantitative mass spectrometry for the production of these different neuropeptides. And what we found was that desacetyl alpha MSH was produced at easily detectable quantities, and uh, somewhat surprisingly and encouragingly, we also saw that there was roughly equimolar production of beta MSH. And this is important because the existence of beta MSH in humans has been controversial. And these data really kind of definitively show that this is a, a real peptide that is produced by human cells. We also saw that beta endorphin was produced at even higher levels, but the real surprise is that alpha MSH which is thought to, in, from, based on studies in mice, to play the predominant role in regulating food intake, was produced at very low levels. So to confirm that this wasn't just some artifact of our culture system, we took advantage of the fact that we have a local brain bank where we can get fresh samples of primary human brain tissue. We performed the same quantitative mass spectrometry. We found essentially exactly the same result, where Desacetyl alpha MSH and beta MSH were produced at very similar quantities and at much higher quantities than the mature alpha MSH. So this suggests that not only does beta MSH likely play a prominent role in human energy homeostasis, but that we need to rethink kind of the central role that's been, that's been uh, ascribed to, to alpha MSH. Since we have access now to these live human hypothalamic neurons, which of course we don't from postmortem material, we can ask, does the production of these neuropeptides, uh, is it altered in response to hormones such as leptin? So what we did was we incubated our cultures with the hormone leptin, and we found that indeed there is a robust induction of both this of both alpha MSH and beta MSH and beta endorphin in response to leptin. So this really establishes this culture system as a powerful tool to study human metabolic sensing. So just to conclude this aspect of the talk, 
have shown that human hypothalamic neurons are efficiently produced in vitro, that POMC neurons generate these appetite-regulating pep peptides that have an identical sequence and a similar abundance to their counterparts in, in the primary human brain tissue, and finally, that these cells actively respond to the hormone leptin. But the question that remains is, which cell lines should be used for disease modeling? And that takes me into kind of the second part of the talk, which is how can we use genetic information to decide which cell lines should we invest the time and energy into to develop these disease models? And previous studies have shown that the difference of genetic background can be important, and also that over time and culture, human pluripotent stem cell lines can acquire epigenetic aberrations, such as the erosion of X chromosome inactivation, and also large structural variants, such as copy number variants and aneuploidy, which can affect hundreds or thousands of genes. However, relatively little was known about what, what about smaller structural variants or sequence variants, which can have a potent effect on, on, uh, on cellular phenotypes that are perhaps unrelated to the disease that one is wishing to study. So this is uh, the, the work that I'm going to show was done as part of a much larger team. I'm showing some of the important members of this team, uh, postdoc Dia Ghosh, who I work with closely, um, and Kevin Egan and Steve McCarroll uh, at, at Harvard and the Broad Institute, as well as Nissen Benvenissi at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. So what we did was to uh, was to acquire 114 commonly used research-grade human embryonic stem cell lines, drawing heavily upon the list of, of stem cell lines that are on the NIH registry of lines approved for, for use with federal funds, as well as 29 cell pellets from lines that had been prepared for potential clinical use under good manufacturing practice or GMP conditions. We then analyzed these 143 cell lines by a combination of high-density DNA microarrays, whole exome sequencing, and whole genome sequencing. And in particular, what we focused on was the common sequence variants that give information about the ancestry of those cell lines, whether they're directly related to us, and what their burden of common polygenetic, uh, polygenic variants are that predispose them to different different traits or diseases. We also looked at rare sequence variants that are associated with human disease, as well as structural variants, such as, the, such as large or small copy number variants, um, which can affect, again, tens to hundreds of genes and potentially are going to influence cellular phenotypes. And together, by, by analyzing down at from the single nucleotide level to the level of entire chromosomes, we can obtain this integrated view of human genetic variation. So first, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the work that we did on structural variants. So historically, this has been done by karyotyping and G-banding or by DNA microarrays. Um, but we wanted to ask, can whole genome sequence data give uh, richer information about about these copy number variants. And indeed, we found that not only could we call many of the same variants that we could by microarray, but we could also refine the boundaries. So here, what I'm showing on a graph on the y-axis is the normalized read depth of, of the different lines. Um, what we see is that the normalized read depth is around two, which you'd expect for, for an autosome, um, but that some of these cell lines are, sh are showing a deletion and that the borders of this deletion can be more accurately called by whole genome sequencing, just since we have many more variants which, uh, whose copy number we can analyze than we would by microarray, which will have just a series of probes that are distributed within and without of the borders of, of the CNV. And if we look at this uh, quantitatively and just consider copy number variants that are large, meaning that there are 500 um, kilobase pairs or larger, we find that most of the, uh, most of the uh, CNVs that we've called by whole genome sequencing, we also called by, mic my, by microarray, so that accounts for about 60% of them, but that there's another 40%, so another 23 variants among the 121 cell lines that we analyze 
that were not detected by microarray, but could, were only seen by whole genome sequencing. But here we're only looking at the very large variants. We can actually go down much lower, down to uh, just a little bit over 1 KB. And this gives us, uh, allows us to look at thousands of additional copy number variants by whole genome sequencing that we could not detect at all by microarray. Next, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that we've done to look at single nucleotide variants. And in particular, we're interested in those single nucleotide variants that were likely acquired in culture. And the way that we identified those was to look at rare heterozygous variants, which would be expected to be distributed at a 50-50 fraction of, of alleles, um, of the, the reference and the alternate allele. But what we noticed when we graphed these is that there was a small tail in this distribution. And this left-hand tail corresponded to, to sites where the the alternate or likely mutated allele was present at an unexpectedly low fraction. And this would be consistent with it having been acquired in culture and present only in a subpopulation of the cells. And when we looked at all of the genes that had these candidate mosaic variants, there's only a single one that was affected more than once. And that turned out to be the tumor suppressor P53 or TP53. And if we look at the codons that were affected in, in cell lines carrying these TP, TP53 mutations, uh, they mapped perfectly onto those codons that were most frequently seen in human cancer. So what I'm showing in the top graph, the y-axis here, is the frequency at which these codons are mutated in the general population as represented in the EXAC database. And in the lower graph, I'm showing the percentage of all human tumors that carry a mutation that, uh, that causes a change in that particular codon. And I've highlighted the mutations in the codons that we found in red. And what you see is that this, this maps really perfectly onto, onto the mutations that are most commonly found in human cancer. And the reason that they're so commonly found in human cancer is that the amino acids encoded by these codons play a critical role in the association of P53 with DNA. And in fact, they act as dominant negatives when you have these mutations. So in the heterozygous state, it, this leads to a dramatic loss in P53 activity. Another nice thing about the fact that these, these variants happen to be mosaic, meaning that they're only found in a subset of cells in the culture, is that it allowed us to do these natural competition experiments to ask, does, do these mutations actually confer some growth advantage on these cells? And it, so really, this is already a perfect isogenic comparison because we're comparing exactly the same cell lines, and just a subset of them are going to carry the mutation. And if we just continue culturing these cells, what we see is that the mutant cells, which are shown in red here, over time in culture, which is shown on the x-axis, gradually outcompete the wild-type cells and reach a state of fixation. So we found these mutations in cell lines that we had acquired, but we really wondered, is, is this true also of other uh, cell lines that are out there in general circulation? And since more and more sequencing data is being published, and since P53 is a gene that's expressed in stem cells, we could mine published RNA sequencing data and look for evidence of other P53 mutations. So we did this together with Nissim ben and and, uh, and a very talented graduate student of his, Yishai Avior. And when Yishai did this work, he found uh, an additional, uh, you know, large number of additional mu mutations in P53, so that together we found 15 distinct instances in the 252 cell lines that we found. So this is telling us that P53 is likely playing an important role in regulating survival or prol proliferation in human pluripotent stem cells, such that loss of P53 gives a significant growth advantage to these cells. The other real advantage of looking at the RNA sequencing data is that certain cell lines are very widely used. For example, the H9 or WA09 cell line is used by many different groups, and this allowed us to detect four distinct mutations in four different groups that had likely independently arisen. So this is telling us that clearly this is 
this is a mutation that can occur spontaneously and then can arise to a level of, uh, that's detectable by either RNA sequencing or whole exome or whole genome sequencing because it confers this growth advantage. So I've talked a lot about these p53 mutations, but what about other germline variants that might be relevant for disease? So we have done a little bit of work to, to try to identify some of those variants. And if we looked at just those variants that are present in the ClinVar database and are associated with autosomal dominant disease, we see that there are genes that affect multiple different cellular pathways uh, and, and body systems. So for example, we see mutations um, in the, the, that are in, in eyes, in the nervous system, in the endocrine system, in the cardiovascular system, and many of these, and many of the cell types uh, that are important for these body systems, such as cardiomyocytes in, in uh, the cardiovascular system, are frequently generated from human pluripotent stem cells and are used to model disease or look at disease toxicity. And so it's important to know that there are some, some cell lines that are out there in general circulation that happen to have mutations that have been associated with, for example, long QT syndrome. And so what we really want this data to, to, to um, allow us to do is to, first of all, serve as a resource for the field. So we're planning to publish both the raw data and the analyzed data, and also to provide an interactive data portal for groups to easily look across different cell lines for uh, mutations in a gene of interest, or to look um, at a particular cell line and get an idea of what are all of the different mutations that might be present within that particular cell line. We also, um, by, by analyzing these data, have been able to generate new insights into human embryonic stem cell biology, both by looking at these germline variants, but also looking at recurrently mutated genes and pathways, which include other members of the P53 pathway and other oncogenes. And together, these data hopefully will allow us to generate guidelines to enable other groups to rationally select human embryonic stem cell lines for research or clinical use. So to summarize what I've told you uh, in the second part of the talk, uh, I've, I've uh, discussed how human pluripotent stem cells, including ES and IPS cells, recurrently acquire mutations in P53, that they do carry disease-associated germline mutations, just as the general human population also has, and that these data will be provided as a resource to the field to enable the rational selection of cell lines. And so the takeaway message that I want to leave you with is that understanding the genetic background of human pluripotent stem cells is really important to consider if you want to choose the right cell line to use and also to properly interpret the results of your disease modeling experiments. So next I want to show you the most important slide of all, and that's the acknowledgement slide, because obviously any of this work is a team effort, and I'm really indebted to the people who've, who've helped me along the way, the wonderful members of the Merkel Lab, um, my collaborators, and in particular, I've highlighted here in, uh, in, uh, in, in bold font, Dia Ghosh, who is the postdoc who uh, played a, a, a real leadership role in the bioinformatics of all of the work that I've, uh, that I've told you about in the second half of the talk and the funders, both past and present, that have enabled this work to be done. So finally, I just want to thank you very much for your attention. Um, I've put my email address and uh, my Twitter handle on there. If you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you very much.